Welcome everyone to the Center for the Study of Existential Risk panel on why didn't technology save us from COVID-19? Thank you for joining us today. Uh, a little bit about our center, the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, or CISO for short, because I think we'll say that a couple of times. Uh, we are an interdisciplinary center at the University of Cambridge. We're dedicated to the study and mitigation of existential risk. There is both a sometimes depressing, but extremely interesting job, and we cover quite a wide range of risks uh, from emerging technologies like AI and some versions of biotech to um, pressing risks like climate change, ecosystem collapse, and of course, biological risks. In fact, one of the projects that we started at the center that I am a member of, and maybe that's the most credentials I can have for chairing this panel because I'm neither a biologist nor a health practitioner, is being part of the team of a project we call Lessons from COVID-19, where we're trying to get lessons from how this global pandemic was handled, where we did things well and where we did things more poorly, not just so we can have lessons for public health, but lessons for how do we handle global catastrophic risks more broadly. Our bar for global catastrophic risks is quite high, sometimes 1% of the global population or a billion deaths, so COVID-19 is not of that magnitude, but we still think there are a lot of interesting systemic effects uh, in this um, global disaster that we can learn a lot from. If you're interested in that project, please reach out to me or any of the other people working on this project, and there is more information on CISO's website. I should also say before we dig into all of the places where we technology may have not worked so well for us, that uh, I am personally, and I imagine the panelists are also very grateful for everyone who's trying to deal with this pandemic, whether they are in research and development or frontline healthcare workers or in the administration of dealing with this very major challenge. Uh, and we in no way want to criticize the work, but we do want to think how we might do better and also highlight some of the systemic factors. Uh, with that, I am delighted that we have a very experienced panel here to talk about these issues, more, much more experienced than I am. So I very much look forward to hearing what they have to say. Uh, Alexa Haggerty, um, if you would like to wave, Alexa. <laughs> uh, Alexa Haggerty is a medical anthropologist, uh, a scholar of science, technology, and society studies, or STS. Um, she uh, investigates societal impacts and the human rights implications of artificial intelligence and machine learning systems. Her research focuses on affected communities and utilizes ethnographic and participatory methods. She is a research associate at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk and also a research fellow at the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence. She is also a co-convener of the Other Loveless Institute, uh, Institute's Just AI Network and a fellow of the World Economic Forum Global Future Council on Systemic Inequalities and social cohesion. Freya Jeffcott uh, is a research associate also at our center, CISO, uh, where she combines anthropology and epidemiology to improve our understanding, uh, understanding of responses to outbreaks of unknown etiology. In addition to her research, Freya also does intermittent policy and applied work for the WHO, the World Health Organization, and MSF, Medicine Sans Frontier including being a manager of epidemiological activities on the two recent Ebola outbreaks. Freya is a co-founder uh, of the non-for-profit non startup uh, Universa, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, which creates web-based disease surveillance tools for recent limited settings. Uh, and finally, Charlotte Hammer uh, is a field epidemiologist uh, with the European Center for Disease Control based in Helsinki. She's also currently a CISA affiliate. And from October, she will be joining Downing College uh, and the Disease Dynamics Unit in Cambridge as a research fellow in emerging infectious diseases. Very much looking forward to what they have to say. I should also mention that the opinions expressed uh, by the panelists are their own and do not necessarily express the views or opinions of their respective employers. Uh, I'll repeat what I said at the beginning in case anyone has joined since then, that this session is being recorded, but that attendees uh, cannot be seen or heard and that the recording uh, will go up on our YouTube channel. I'll also mention that we're going to have 10 minutes at the end for questions, so please use the Q&A function, not the chat, because people on Eventbrite can't use the chat. Please use the Q&A function, and I will draw on these questions as they come up, particularly near the end. So to start us off, I know that the panelists, being good academics, will always want to start with problematizing the question. So our question is, why didn't technology save us from COVID-19? You know, why are we with you know, 4 million confirmed deaths uh, of people uh, diagnosed with COVID and likely death toll much higher, given all the work that goes into uh, biotechnologies and other relevant technologies. 
But maybe the question we should ask is, why did we expect technology to save us? And it seems there was a general sentiment that technology will save us. So Alexa, would you like to start us off on this question? Yes, I would. Um, thank you for, for um, the invitation to be part of this panel. And it's really an honor and a pleasure to, to um, have this conversation with Freya and Charlotte, um, who I know will have so much to contribute. So I'm looking forward to sharing and learning. I think that one of the reasons that we had this expectation is that we have an idea of technology as a silver bullet um, rather than something more prosaic, like one tool among many. But even as we think about you know, tool as a metaphor, we have to think about the ways in which tools depend on know-how and training and collaboration with people using other tools and infrastructure and so on. And here's where I think that um, borrowing a term like socio-technical system from STS, even though it's a term that's a bit unwieldy and maybe pretentious, is actually really helpful because it helps us think about the way in which technologies are one part of complex systems that also involve uh, humans and our societies and the full context. So technology just doesn't travel solo and nor is it an object. So I think that if we can think about um, technologies as part of systems, that that will um, help us interrogate what we can learn, what went well and what didn't, because it, as technology has a place in a system, it may be that there are the most sort of vulnerable and fragile connections in the system that determine its success, not necessarily the sort of shiny um, technological object that we fixate on. So in that sense, I would say that, you know, we did um, invent rather clever contact tracing apps, but those are only useful insofar as we could support people to self-isolate, um, give people the material support they needed to self-isolate. Or, you know, we have created um, life-saving vaccines, but if we're looking at high income countries with less than 20% of the global population, you know, buying up more than half of these vaccines, then we have to think about the whole system. So I'll end there and um, pass. Freya, would you like to come in on the question of why did we even think technology is gonna do the job for us? Um, I would indeed. I, I was inclined when you first said that question to maybe go down the history route of why we might have these expectations, especially in relation to a large natural pandemic. Um, but I'm, I'm really tempted to kind of dive in on what Alexa said, which I agree with wholeheartedly, but maybe I'll hold off on that. So a, a little bit of the history as to why we might have had great expectations for technology. I mean, this isn't going to be the entirety of the explanation, but I think it's important to reflect on the fact that there was this really key junction in the late 1980s in relation to sort of strategies for combating emerging infectious diseases. Uh, there'd been this sort of sudden recognition of the global spread of HIV and some other large epidemics and the fact that uh, sort of connected to modernity was this rise of emerging infectious diseases that we created these conditions, not only for emergence, but sort of rapid global spread. And at this kind of key junction strategy, initially there was a reflection, oh, we need to address the drivers of disease emergence and spread, the sort of deforestation, high density farming, housing conditions, all of these things. And as such, bring in sort of ecologists, um, political scientists, demographers, all of these. But then there was this little bit of a sort of switch in the early 90s where you had a really prominent, amazing microbiologists like Joshua Lederberg, um, it's sort of through the Institute of Medicine and other prominent American um, medical institutions, deciding the strategy should actually be a microbiological one and sort of framing it that way and saying what we needed was more investment in vaccine development and treatments and technologies, which are obviously all wonderful things, but it was made as an explicit choice against trying to deal with the more intractable sort of social and environmental factors uh, in fact, even in a sort of editorial after this big Institute of Medicine report came out that said this, these are the things we'd invest in, these technological fixes for emerging infectious diseases. Um, Lederberg wrote this editorial that essentially said, we're doing this because uh, the history of sort of a social experimentation and uh, trying to act on poverty would lead one in despair. So it was a kind of an almost surrender. We can't deal with the things that actually produce disease. So maybe we'll try to go for these sort of more remote fixes. I'm not sure that that served us well, but it certainly kind of set the stage for what kind of professionals 
um, could determine the solutions to natural pandemics and also what we might expect to be the solutions. And I think we still see some of that today. Um, sorry, that was a bit of a sort of a historical tangent. And yeah, hopefully we can come back to Alexa's stuff later. And extremely useful. And I'll ask you to uh, note down uh, your thoughts about Alexa, but I would like uh, to give Charlotte a chance to also come in and give your initial thoughts on the question of why did we expect technology to save us from this pandemic? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I also refrain from jumping in on, on those two fascinating um, starts. But I think, in a way, growing it all together, um, looking for a technological solution is, I think, very inherently human. Um, no matter what the problem is, we all want someone or something external to solve our problems. Um, and I think that's, that's very human and that's very us. Um, and like I said, this is not specific to COVID-19. Um, so if you, if you look at climate change and all the very techy solutions that are being suggested, things like CO2 filters, um, I think there are very strong parallels there, although I'm, I'm by no means a climate scientist. But for the vast majority of, of people, thinking tech means kind of externalizing problems and solutions. And at the same time, that means um, you are both no longer required to come up with a solution yourself and you're also no longer part of the problem. And that is a very comforting thought, I think. And um, tech has really bought into that. I mean, over the last couple of decades, we've really been um, aggressively marketed at that tech has a solution for everything. So while the actual technologies might look very opaque to, to us and also to decision makers, the approach of using technology to solve problems is actually something we see all the time. And as such, it's a very familiar approach to a problem. Whereas um, traditional public health practices have kind of um, disappeared from our daily lives and they are not as, as much seen anymore. So they are not as familiar an approach, I would say. And we've really come into that situation where we've, we've lulled into uh, ourselves into a sense of security. Oh, we don't need traditional public health. I mean, we're immune to infectious disease threats. That's something that happens over there in less developed societies, not here. Um, of course, that's entirely wrong. Um, it's just, it's, it's no longer in the news as much. And actually these uh, so-called less developed societies that have had um, big infectious disease threats like Ebola over the last couple of years, they are much more prepared than we are because we, we've to a certain degree become complacent uh, with all our tech and with all our very high global health security preparedness scores. And that certainly has, has led us down a very dangerous route. Um, may I come back uh, now and sort of, yeah. Please, please go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I think exactly what uh, Charlotte and Alexa have tapped on. Uh, very early in the UK in particular, especially in sort of maybe the press and I think some policymakers maybe push this too. There was this idea that uh, technological innovation in particular, not existing technologies, but new ones in the forms of vaccines and diagnostics and apps and such would be some kind of deus ex machina, that they would be the end of the epidemic. There would be this nice, simple solution. Um, and actually that was always the wrong framing. Uh, this is something that Charlotte uh, brought up yesterday in discussion actually. This idea that when I say vaccine, I still kind of think of vaccine as this one particular, uh, you know, bit of mRNA or whatever in a syringe. But actually, when Charlotte says uh, vaccine, because at the moment she's in a lot more contact with applied public health people, uh, she means this entire infrastructure for sort of delivering it globally, for manufacturing it, for overcoming sort of problems on the ground. I, suddenly it becomes a lot less shiny and a lot less simple. But this really important framing for technology was very much missing from the early rhetoric of this pandemic. Um, and I think if you do a lot of on the ground public health, you were immediately skeptical to all of this. But it didn't get sort of, uh, sort of tempered for a very long time. And I think even now there are people that believe that just because we have an effective and safe vaccine, that's it. Everything's over. All the complexity and sort of intractable issues are gone. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. I think I think that's great. Um, I know that you might want to come back on that one. I think that would be a very natural segue to the next one. So you feel free to wrap in your comments on other panelists into the next question, because I think Freya, actually, your comment leads us directly to the next one, um, which is just getting a little bit more into the context of what, I mean, there are many technologies. There's not one technology 
it will save us from the pandemic. And in our preparatory discussion, we talked that it could mean anything from vaccines. In fact, we've just seen vaccine is more complex than just vaccine, but also spreadsheets, right? In you know, 1918, we did not use computers to handle uh, the global pandemic. And maybe the technologies that are more in the background are also worth discussing. So to all of you, uh, maybe if you can reflect a little bit more on, you know, from vaccines to spreadsheets, what make technology in the service of finding pandemics actually work? Um, and Charlotte, would you like to start with this one? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll jump in on what Freya just said to a certain degree. Uh, but yeah, I, it was it was kind of a little bit a light bulb moment when we started to talk about what is tech actually. I mean, um, I mean, we always talk, talk about these shiny new things, but it made me reflect on well, what about my laptop and my statistics program? I mean, I use that every day as an epidemiologist. Is that the kind of tech we're talking about? And then also, um, kind of pitching onto that uh, vaccines and vaccination discussion. Um, how do we distinguish the tech from the logistics of delivering and utilizing it? Um, so yeah, you can see vaccines as this very narrow bit of mRNA. And um, I mean, all of us in, in EPI, we're all nerds at our heart. Uh, so I found that majorly cool, but it doesn't really help anyone in any meaningful way immediately. Uh, whereas vaccination does, but that implies like a whole vaccination campaign. It implies logistics, um, but also ethical things like um, prioritization, uh, behavioral issues, such as uh, increasing vaccine acceptance and targeted communication. So it's it's much broader than that and much more complicated, but it still wouldn't work without the tech. Um, so, so not to take away from that. Um, as talking about spreadsheets, uh, that's always a dangerous topic when having an epi in the room because we could geek out about spreadsheets all day. Um, I had actually never considered them tech. It's a fascinating um, idea. I can certainly see how they can be conceived as tech um, or as tools at least uh, because to us, spreadsheets are kind of the bread and butter of what we do. Uh, you can't do outbreak investigations, you can't do surveillance without a spreadsheet. Um, we all have our line lists, so that's our list of, of cases, um, and that is really at the very core of epidemiology. Now I think the, the other bit of tech that really warrants being mentioned here is testing. Um, and I mean we've seen testing at vast scales, um, but testing is actually much more complex than just using this um, piece of technology uh, at scale. So we have the, the very real consequences of testing um, regarding things like isolation support that was already mentioned, um, but also regarding the, the context of the testing. And that has in many recent discussions fallen a bit by the wayside, I think. So the first thing there is to consider the, the prevalence of the disease, which has, so how much disease is around, and that has impact on testing and on testing results. Um, so that's what we mean when we talk about uh, pretest probability. How much disease you have in a population um, determines with the same test, the same specificity and uh, sensitivity, um, how likely you are to get false results in either direction. And that was discussed a bit in the beginning of the pandemic with regards to antibody tests. Um, so those are the tests that tell you if you've had COVID. And there we will often say, oh, well, if you do one, the, the likelihood of you having had COVID, so the, the amount of disease in the population is so low that your, your positive is most likely a false positive. Um, but we haven't really talked about that with regards to other types of tests. And then even further complicating the issue is doing testing in the context of vaccine rollout when you look particularly at antigen tests. Um, so that's what most in the UK will be more um, familiar with the term lateral flow test, but a lateral flow test is actually one type of antigen test. And these are already generally more suitable to symptomatic than to asymptomatic persons. But if you throw in vaccination on top of that, and you're testing uh, large numbers of vaccinated asymptomatic individuals, you will run into a lot of problems that need to be considered. Um, and those problems resolve around the viral load. Um, so people who are vaccinated, even if they are infected, they will have lower viral loads. And they are pretty much undetectable to most antigen tests at least in a lot of searchings. Um, additionally, the likelihood of these people to be able to transmit the disease is very much contested and probably very low. So there's a lot of discussion to be had about the, the sensibility of um, testing asymptomatic vaccinated individuals. 
Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't necessarily do it, but I think um, we are having too little conversations about that. We're just relying on the tech and not considering the context enough. Thank you. Uh, that was extremely illuminating. Um, and I think everyone who has been following the news and trying to gig out uh, just got a good dose of why it is that we need experts who know so much more than our uh, people on sidelines. But Alexa, over to you, because I think you have a, another way of complicating the way we think about <laughs> yes. what makes these technologies work. Um, yeah, this is so interesting. And I want to circle circle back to testing if we have a chance. But um, I wanted to share a, a short quote from Ursula Le Guin that really sort of opened my mind about thinking about technology. Um, and I'm just going to indulge, if you'll indulge me, I'll just read it. So she writes that technology is the active human interface with the material world, but the word is consistently misused to mean only the enormously complex and specialized technology of the past few decades. And here I would say that we could think about how we get mixed up between innovation and technology. So to continue with, with Ursula, she says, we've been so desensitized by 150 years of ceaselessly expanding technical prowess that we think nothing less complex and showy than a computer or a jet bomber deserves to be called technology at all, as if linen were the same thing as flax, as if paper, wheels, clocks, aspirin were natural objects that were born with like our teeth and fingers. And I, I just love this quote because I think that this is exactly where we tend to get mixed up. We um, in our systems of technology, we're dealing with all kinds of technologies, um, as well as all kinds of judgment calls, as, as Charlotte just pointed out, all these nuances around the technology. So something that has really stayed in my mind is thinking about the Pfizer vaccine, which we know needs to be, you know, ultra chilled, and how in a place like Sierra Leone, which has almost 8 million people in their population, there's only one small freezer that can do this, and it's already being used to store Ebola vaccine. So that when we're thinking about technology, we have to be thinking about you know, this freezer as well as this vaccine in the sense of like the vial of vaccine, as well as the vaccine in the sense that I think Charlotte so has so... Um, illuminatingly used it as a whole system, you know, of, of everything from development to, to getting it into people's arms. So, so that's um, my two cents and I'll pass to Freya and then maybe we'll circle back. Um, yeah, I, I, again, I have this whole list of points I'd love to like dive in on there. Um, I, I think I'm going to go with the innovation um, isn't, like the, the confounding of innovation and technology, because I mean, I, I think that that is a real issue here. Um, this uh, sense of a new technology will be the revolutionary or transformative. Um, this is a bit outside the current COVID pandemic, but it's something that I don't know, I see it again and again with different epidemics when you end up getting sort of deployed to resource limited setting is actually how quickly we sort of go back to earlier versions of things, how like, I swear every time before a kind of field uh, deployment as an epidemiologist, they're like, okay, are you up to date on this new statistical package and this new program and all the rest? And I spend like the week before getting savvy with it. And then within a couple of weeks of actually being on the ground, you're back to the oldest version of Excel you can possibly find because you want to be able to share spreadsheets and analyses easily with the people doing the bulk of the work on the ground. I think this is one of the issues. We have to also talk about a proximity to the problem and where that fits in kind of technological deployment or innovation. The fact that a lot of the kind of innovative technologies that we put so much attention on are somewhat removed, they're kind of top-down solutions. Whereas actually when you're working on the ground, the people who have to deliver public health, the people that have to support the sick or do the case finding or try and address the environmental issues that lead to the spread of disease. Uh, housing density is a huge one for coronaviruses. Um, then what they're using is really what's important, what facilitates their work. I think the most revolutionary technology I've seen recently in terms of infectious disease surveillance has been WhatsApp. There've been that many different kind of data sending collection systems that people have attempted to like deploy across sub-Saharan Africa. It's, it's a bit insane. But WhatsApp that everybody has and uses and really fits that niche has been what changes and what you need to engage with if you want to do the work well. 
And I think the idea of creating new innovative solutions uh, from the top down, rather than looking at the problems, challenges and technologies on the ground up is really where we get into trouble sometimes here. Sorry, I tried to like cover every point there, but hopefully people can clean that up for me now. <laughs> No, I think that is great. Alexa, did you want to come back on the yeah, issue I just, of testing? Yeah, well, no, I don't want to, well, okay. <laughs> so there's you already so many interesting things, yeah. So I wanted to pick up on what Frey was saying, and then I think what has, you know, has already been in the conversation here, which is that, uh, you know, innovation may have a place, but we don't want to focus only on innovation. And it's that technology may ha has a place, but it may not be the, tech, the most powerful technology, you know, might be a very, um, might be WhatsApp or might be an old version of Excel. So I think that, uh, and this is something that Freya brought up in our previous conversations preparing for this panel, was that it's really maybe thinking about um, top-down technology. So for example, um, that I've been working on a contact tracing project with uh, the London Borough of Hackney, and they have developed, they've used a lot of spreadsheets and they have also developed a local technology that helps them with their contact tracing and with their other kinds of social support. And that technology is working really, really well because it's actually not a top-down technology. It was a technology that was very much built um, for their particular needs. So there, I think that that might be one of the lessons we can begin to pull out here is that we can't think about technology as this sort of homogenous thing that there's all sorts of kinds of technology and you know local sort of ground up technology may be a very powerful tool indeed. And I think this leads actually a very nice segue into the next question, uh, which is a question of, I mean, technology does not come for free. Um, so over the course of the pandemic and maybe particularly in the early stages, uh, what and how did we choose to fund? Which technologies did we find and maybe which technologies or other solutions we did not fund? And I think adjacent to that, uh, who or what uh, expert or expertise did we fail to hear when making the kinds of decisions about what to deploy? Uh, Freya, will you, are you happy to start us off on this one? Um, I am, though. I think I'd been having sort of like a bigger picture thoughts on the funding when we'd prepared for this panel rather than necessarily in the early days, because I, I sometimes think we have to be careful not diving into lifeboat economics with public health. People like pretend that we only have this tiny amount of finite resources and therefore it's an either or. And actually, I think one of the issues maybe if we take issue with technology isn't technology in itself, or these innovative technologies, it's what they might have diverted attention away from. But it's quite hard to sort of quantify that without someone doing a large review. My impression, however, is that there was far more of an appetite for supporting, at least in terms of research, sort of technological innovations, and again, innovations rather than um, sort of adapting, adjusting existing tools or looking at the ground up. And again, I think it was another problem with sort of the distribution of opportunity, that there was a lot more opportunity to cultivate this idea of providing a solution at the national level than there was, say, if you were like actually working within a community to try and do disease control. I, I, sorry, going back to sort of the earlier questions maybe, I think this was maybe one of the most apparent, I don't want to say issues, but maybe issues with the pandemic response within the UK was I got a strong sense of them trying to manage a pandemic almost exclusively from the national level, at least from my armchair reading papers and such. Uh, that This idea that you could control a pandemic just through kind of without any sort of devolution of authority and capacity and resources in a big way. Like there almost wasn't trust to let sort of local areas manage a pandemic at all. Like that wasn't a thing. Whereas actually, if you manage epidemics regularly, you know that it's sort of district disease control officers, local public health officials that do almost all the heavy lifting. And so I think actually there were sort of, funding was diverted much to technological, especially innovative solutions, but also to the sort of, uh, I don't know what the correct term, but these kind of national level figures and institutions and ideas. Uh, rather than the local. Um, I, if we get a chance at the end, I would like to come back to talk about pandemic preparedness because we are CESA and the fact that there is clearly funding going towards, again, innovative technology rather than actually addressing drivers of disease emergence. But sorry, I'll let Charlotte and Alexa take over for now. Yeah, I think, I think we'll come back to this point maybe once we've got, gone one loop around. So uh, Charlotte would like to go next on the funding or expertise question. 
Uh, yeah, definitely. And I also definitely have a lot to say about pandemic preparedness and the future of pandemic preparedness. Um, but kind of to mirror what Freya has said, um, I think that approach, um, so we've, we've seen the issue of national over the local. Um, we've also seen a uh, external versus established. Um, and I think both of those things have led to a lot of reinventing the wheel. Um, so I've had, in, especially in the early stages of the pandemic, had very long discussions um, with very well-meaning, extremely well-educated people from adjacent or completely different fields who wanted to bring their expertise in. Um, and that expertise is very welcome, but not if it completely disregards everything done beforehand. Um, so if, if there's absolutely no awareness of what surveillance is and how surveillance works, um, you will run into problems very, very quickly. Um, and that really mirrors sort of my experience with the early stages of the pandemic, and especially when I looked at the UK, because my constant question was, oh, where are my colleagues from field epidemiology? I know they exist. I know they are doing amazing work, but they were just not present, at least not in, in, the, in the media and in the public eye. Um, it was all modeling. There was such a strong focus on modeling and don't get me wrong, modeling can be an extremely useful tool, um, but it's not your only tool and it's not necessarily the first tool I would run to when responding to an outbreak, no matter of what scale. So that was very surprising to me. Um, I have to say this has shifted um, and especially with the, the variants of concern and the um, risk assessment and monitoring of these, there, there's been some amazing traditional epi um, being done by colleagues at Public Health England that has also kind of come to, to public attention and has been, been publicized to the level that it deserves. Um, but there's one other thing that I would really like to, to point out here because with our kind of focus on tech, I think we've also made one very, very big error that we are at the latest now kind of seeing and feeling the effects of in, in our field. And that's we've we've become a little bit ignorant to human requirements and to the fact that tech solutions still need need humans. Um, I don't know how often I've been asked on social media and also within kind of my family and friends circle, uh, why haven't you fixed the weekend effect in one and a half years of pandemic? Um, so the weekend effect is that where we see this this dip in case numbers around weekend and Monday each week. And it's, it's very common, it happens with every disease, it, it's completely expected from, from a public health point of view. Um, and I think it has to do with the, the fact that we have this instant information age going on and people that just think information is just instantly there without human input required. But for those numbers to be there on national news, you need testing to be done, you need lab analysis to be done, you need data to be input, data to be analyzed and data to be output. And you can run that uh, kind of on a 24 seven scale for a while, but after a year and a half, it, there's just no human resources anymore. There's no workforce to run this at that scale uh, without running people completely into the ground. And, and that's what, something we're now seeing with, with unprecedented levels of burnout among um, EPIs and public health colleagues, because a lot of people have put in way more hours than is humanly possible. And that's something that tech cannot solve for us. It's something that requires long-term investment in public health, um, all the way from, from training to, to retaining skilled public health practitioners. And that is not shiny, that is not pretty, that is not something to put on national news necessarily, but it's extremely important. Um, also in light of the fact that a lot of diseases have just disappeared with COVID, um, not because they necessarily have disappeared, although that did happen with things like the flu, where we just had a lot of the, the measures against COVID have also worked against the flu, but a lot of them have also disappeared because no one can pay attention to them anymore. Because I mean, um, even if we work people to the ground, the day still has only 24 hours. Thank you. Sobering thoughts. Uh, Alexa, um, anything you would like to add on the yeah. question of yeah, funding and expertise? Yeah, I want to come at this um, from a slightly orthogonal <laughs> angle here, but I, I think that this is important. So I think that one thing to think about here are that we're dealing with sort of different logics between our public sector technology and private sector technology. So in the in the private sector, there's you know very often this idea of the, the minimal viable product that there's sort of this 80-20, this sort of ethos of, of agile lean design. 
But in public sector technology, edge cases can't be ignored. You have a requirement, a legal requirement, an ethical obligation to, to care for everyone. And I think that when these two logics meet, um, there are some, some things that happen that you might not think of. So I think the one thing that can happen is that sometimes there are innovations that come in and kind of scoop out some of the easiest cases or the easiest um, things to deal with. But then what that actually does is put a burden for all the more difficult complex cases and more difficult complex work onto like local or public um, sector people who, so, so this is, I think has to do with this sort of burnout, which is that um, there can be some technological innovations that sort of come in and do some easy work, but that there's all of this invisible, very difficult um, work going on all the time. So I'm so glad that Charlotte brought our attention to thinking about burnout, to thinking about energy, to thinking about time, which are these resources that are um, so crucial um, in fighting this epidemic, but that, you know, often don't get, get attention. And I think that one of the things that really clearly um, brought this into visibility kind of um, last year was around ventilators. So first we had a ventilator shortage. And then what we began, began to see is that even when we have ventilators, even when we have this really important object, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. You have to have people who can run these ventilators. And these are now people who are exhausted. It takes years of training to have someone who can do this. And then you have these people who are absolutely exhausted and stretched very thin. So we don't have, you know, this ventilator or this bed doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists um, as, as a product of human energy, labor, and, and time as well. So. Fair, I wanted to, to see whether you want to come back on this question. I do. Um, again, sorry, I'm split between really wanting to engage with that and the fact that um, obviously there's also ideologies, um, public health ideologies within technologies, and they get deployed, whereas people can often think of them as quite morally uh, neutral or historically neutral and all the rest. But actually, sorry, because I did want to make this point because it's a bit timely. I'll go back to just the money. Um, it, in the last few days, we've seen the announcement of the UK cutting four billion pounds from its aid fund. And this is on the back of lots of declarations about how Britain going forward, we hope it will be a sort of technological leader and innovator and such. And I think that this is maybe repeating what I said at the start, this idea of technological solutions and avoiding engaging with the nitty gritty, because that four billion pound cut to aid, that aid is the kind of things that mitigate the emergence and spread of emerging infectious diseases in a very, very real way. Like, I mean, just if you even if you think of something kind of less reactive and something like surveillance, which doesn't necessarily prevent emergence and um, it's not a sort of reactive response, but surveillance of an emerging infectious disease like coronavirus, uh, the current coronavirus is severely hampered or Ebola, say, by other endemic infectious diseases, febrile illnesses and all the rest. And any failure to address them, say, through standard vaccination or um, bed nets and such for malaria makes surveillance for emerging threats much, much, much harder. Similarly, um, the best way to get a good sort of spread of a new infectious disease is to have a malnourished, displaced population. And anything that doesn't support their well-being is just another kind of chipping away at any kind of um, hope we might have of mitigating the next disease. So I think at the moment there is a really crucial junction in funding, and we are seeing a lot of attention and investment, at least in the UK, again, towards technological innovation, whilst perhaps failing to meet not just moral commitments, but very real commitments to tangibly doing what we know works against um, public health threats. Sorry, so I just wanted to end that on the funding question. Thank you, uh, all of you. Um, maybe a bit of a call for maybe doing things better, you know, not just in the future, but at the present. Um, so we've talked a lot about kind of various junctures and how things could have gone otherwise. Maybe we should have had other people in the room. I wonder for the decisions that we did make, the investments that we did make, the deployment decisions that we did make, what are the impacts of the choices that we did? If you could kind of form your expertise, uh, paint a picture for us. Uh, what is the world we now live, given that we made the choices that we made uh, with technology? 
And Charlotte, I'm going to start with you. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. That's that's now the big questions. Um, although I feel like Freya has already given us a very, very nice way into this uh, with highlighting some of the, the very negative consequences. Um, so I'm, I'm going to dampen that down a little bit. Um, if, if we talk about what choices we have made there's always this question of who, who is the we in this? Um, and I mean, as, as a public health practitioner, um, I can only advise. So I advise based on the best available evidence with regards to my specific area of expertise. However, decision makers will then have to um, make a decision and come up with, with a strategy based on advice from all relevant fields. And obviously there is no, no right or wrong there. There's no exactly this one way forward is the right way. There's always a, a vast amount of possible ways forward. And those will be politically and philosophically colored differently depending on, on your stance. Um, so it is more complex than just looking at the evidence from epidemiology. Um, then on the, on the other hand, sort of as, as a more positive example, um, Yes, we're living through a horrendous pandemic, but this pandemic has also served, I think we have seen that already as an incubator for uh, research and development in biomedical science. I mean, we've, we've developed new technologies and we've also, uh, for technologies that kind of existed already, we've kind of seen large scale proof of concept um, demonstrations. Um, look, at, for example, at mRNA and vector vaccines. And that's not something that's going to go away. That's lessons learned already that can already be applied. And I think that will lead us to developments in the future, for example, for vaccines for diseases where we didn't think a, a, a vaccine was possible in the near future. So there is something positive to come out of this, um, no matter how high the price we paid for it. Um, I'm also going to take this opportunity to kind of throw in my two cents on uh, pandemic preparedness for the future. Um, and there I'm, I'm kind of seeing a light, slumward, more, more bleak um, future. All of us, I think, at this table have to some degree benefited from the sudden influx of attention and funding on pandemic preparedness. Um, and I think what is very, very prominent right now um, is, is kind of all these new research institutes. Uh, in, in the UK, I think the, the most prominent example would be the, the new Centre for Pandemic Research in Oxford with, with Peter Horby at the head of it. Um, but I am quite worried that this attention will go away quite quickly um, once we, we have some kind of end to the pandemic in Western countries. I think attention and funding will dry out very quickly. And depending on how long it takes for the next pandemic to hit, we, we might be almost back to square one by then. Um, and the, the very sad realistic uh, issue here is that another pandemic is a certainty. I mean, it, yeah, it's a question of when, um, but even then I, I think it's very likely that within my lifespan, I will see another pandemic. So funding and attention drying out after everyone's kind of sick and tired of the, this pandemic is a very real risk. Thank you. Um, and Alexa, I would, I would like to hear your perspective on the impacts of the choices we make, we made and make. Yeah, I mean, I really appreciate what Charlotte has just said, which is that I think we already see that there's a sense of people's attention has begun to, to wander um, in the most, the wealthiest countries, even while the pandemic is absolutely in um, full in its full violence in other parts of the world. So this is like, it's quite disturbing because indeed, as Charlotte points out, another pandemic is an absolute, um, is absolutely guaranteed. So we want to be sure, and this is where I think the project at Caesar around lessons learned is so important. We want to be sure that we really learn the lessons that are available here. And I think that, you know, part of the lesson is that this very, difficult, intractable work of actually establishing health equity for, for people everywhere is the work that has to be done. We, we can't shy away from, from that work. Um, so I think that that can feel like a bit disappointing. And maybe that's where we really like, oh, if only we could have a silver bullet, but um, we can't have just a silver bullet. We actually have to do this hard work. So I think that that is um, 
maybe what we can can walk away with is is trying to figure out how do we make this commitment um, how do we figure out sort of incentives even within our own within the academy that will help um, make these long-term slow commitments to the work that will actually protect us from from future pandemics so i'll pass to freya I mean, yeah, I, I wish I'd said what you just said. That's, um, I think that sums up uh, a lot of this and my thoughts on it, on a much more sort of mundane answer to the impacts of our choices. I, I'll go back to, again, um, the, the, the focus on technological innovation as a way out of the pandemic in the early discourse of the pandemic, at least within the UK, because I think this reflects kind of larger urges and trends. Um, which, yeah, just on a sort of more mundane level, the fact that people were so ready to believe that there was the silver bullet solution in these approaches by them. So I think it really left a lot of people unprepared for what it means to be caught in a kind of a disaster like the COVID pandemic. The length of time it takes, the type of work it takes, the sort of ongoing thought, uh, the engagement with the community around you to protect each other and yourselves. Um, it, I think it, the focus on technology really blindsided a lot of people living in the UK against what it would mean to try and tackle a pandemic globally and nationally and the fact you'd have to do both. And that all of these little bits of technology, again, are tools that may bear out well or not. Um, so if we could then go to the sort of bigger picture like Charlotte and Ale Alexa took us to, um, this means that really we, shouldn't make the same mistake going forward. We shouldn't say, oh, but for the future, technological innovation in itself will be enough. We really do, as Alexa said, have to um, engage with the larger problem of addressing the, the global sort of environmental, social, political um, drivers of emergence and spread. Sorry, there's been lots of repetition here, but I think it probably means that we're um, honing in on some particular points around technology and pandemics. No, I think that's um, absolutely required to kind of hammer in on the important messages because they are actionable messages. We're not just talking idly about some interesting disaster over there that would be nice to reflect on. Right? These are live questions. Uh, and I thank you for your time. I would, I know we have a, a wrap up question, but I would like to actually go into the Q&A and pick a few questions from there because I think they would kind of be interesting to discuss. So one question from the um, Q&A uh, is, um, we tackled this pandemic with the technology that we had in 2020. Um, if you could think a little bit, what would it have looked like if it was with the technology of 2000 or 1980? And also there was the reflection of WhatsApp just happening, not from pandemic response or preparedness, just happened outside. So maybe if we look to 2030 or 2040, what are kind of left of field technologies that are not directly related to health might actually be helpful. So if you could think a little bit about that, I don't know. Who would like to start? So just free to, feel free to jump in. Um, so I can I can start on this. Um, and actually, I would say it wouldn't have looked much different in 2020, uh, in 20, no, in 2000, sorry. Uh, clearly my brain's gone a little bit. Um, yes, all the shiny tech has been in the news a lot, but kind of boots on the ground, uh, public health work is not that different in 2002, 2020 or 2021. So actually, I think on the ground, this did not would not have looked much different. Um, there would be bits and pieces that would have been different. Um, you might not have, ha have had the the um, the COVID app, for example. You would probably have had a lot more fax than email. Um, that's actually one of the the things that I think would have been different. It's it's this very low key things. Um, although there's still a lot of facts involved in, in public health response in 2021, just to kind of kind of put, put us back on the ground of reality. So it's the small things, it's about use of mobile phones, it's about use of email, it's not about the big tech things. And um, these things don't play that big a role. So I think it would have looked quite similar in, in 2000. Um, and similarly, I don't think that the core of public health response will change massively in the next 10 to 20 years. There will always be add-ons from technology. Um, and one technology that has certainly made a massive difference um, now, that would not indeed have been possible in 2000, is uh, sequencing, whole genome sequencing and next generation sequencing. 
that is one thing that I think uh, really is, is different. Um, and especially in this case with variants of concern, the ability to identify them, the, the ability to actually pin down why disease dynamics have changed, even though it's a st still the same pandemic. So that's, that's one area where I say tech has made a huge difference in, in under our understanding. Um, but beyond that, I'm, I mean, by my, my profession, I'm very much in the camp that believes that um, the, the shoe leather epidemiology, the field epidemiology is remaining very, very similar and it will remain the core of pandemic response in the future. Alexa Alfaya, would you like to jump in on this question as well? From the field epidemiology perspective, what Charlotte says is absolutely true. I'm not sure that field epidemiology has changed that much since the 1850s and would be markedly different um, then compared to today. Uh, as for sort of going forward to like 2030 or whenever, I would hope actually, I, I would hope because honestly I have no idea, I would hope that it'd be less of a focus on technology as applied reactively and more technology applied preventatively. And again, going back to Alexa's earlier point about what we expect technology to be, I really hope it's an investment in things like plumbing in areas where people don't have plumbing and therefore have huge problems with diarrheal diseases and febrile illnesses and such. I hope it's a focus on uh, making sure that district disease control officers and resource limited settings maybe areas that are at high risk of zoonotic emergence have the fuel for their motorbikes to go investigate case numbers and then the resources to help those people isolate early regardless of whether there's access to the relevant diagnostic test rapidly or not. I really hope our investment in technology goes to the generic and the powerful and I really hope it's oriented towards the people within communities at risk and affected and I hope it's preventative whereas right now I think we're on the reactive, top-down kind of approach. And I don't think it's giving us the dividends it could if it was the other way around. Again, that's not thinking so much about vaccines and such, but we all know they're wonderful. So, um, and that the delivery is important too. Um, okay, so I think that's me. Alexa, would like to come in on this Yeah, one? well, this, I echo um, all the comments. Um, and maybe would just add that if thinking forward to 2030, maybe what we could start to see is something moving away from this top-down approach, but also from this very siloed approach. I mean, maybe what we can begin to think about is sort of what new ways of bringing together um, groups of people with very different expertise so that we have technologists coming in to work you know, very closely with epidemiologists. I mean, maybe there are things that could be developed um, in this sort of close proximity, or maybe even we'll begin to have new fields where we, we don't, um, don't have our sort of tech, tech, technological training so separate from our social training. So that sort of would be my um, sort of provocation or, or hope for the future is that maybe we can begin to, to do something that's not reactive and not top down, but that's actually quite uh, truly multidisciplinary and close to the ground. And then who knows, maybe there are really interesting technologies that could be developed. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of interesting uh, questions in the Q&A, but I did want to give each of our panelists a chance to give some closing remarks because I know we're close, quite close to the end of the hour. The, our prepared question for this was, so did technology save us? I think we have answered this question numerous times in various ways, but if there was like your top one or two messages that you want the, the audience to, to take away and maybe reflect on, you know, how do we do better in the future? Um, anything that goes under this heading and I'll start with you, Freya. Um, it obviously things like vaccines and diagnostic tests saved a lot of people. Uh, they could have saved a lot more though, if we had been more cognizant that they were created within particular sort of political structures that meant that it would save some lives um, very readily and ignore other lives, um, much to everyone's detriment, because obviously pandemics you have to tackle as a world. So I think, yes, technology saved some of us. Um, it could have saved a lot more though, if we had been more reflective on it being born into a messy world and being delivered out into one as well. Um, yeah, so that's me. Thank you. Charlotte? Uh, yeah, to, to kind of um, 
build on that, I think a little bit it's a question of what you mean by saving, but everyone seems to agree that things could have gone better, um, at least in an ideal world. But as a public health practitioner, I don't work in an ideal world. And from a realistic point of view, I think things could have also gone decidedly worse. That's something to, to keep in mind. Um, but also we've seen very different performances of countries that have sort of similar levels of development and of te tech implementation. So the fact that these countries are all on very different trajectories with regards to COVID-19, I think points us towards the, the fact that it's not necessarily tech that saves or fails to save us, it's how we use tech. Uh, because at the, at the end of the day, tech is, is just a tool um, and it can be extremely helpful. It can also be harmful, but it depends on how we use it. And if we look towards the future to, to reiterate that point, um, it's not going to be tech that saves us from the next pandemic. Um, it's going to be things like addressing the root causes. And then we're talking about the, the big scale things. So things like universal health coverage. Uh, things like protecting the environment, making sure that humans do not encroach on animal territory as much as we do right now. Uh, things like addressing climate change as well. So we're, we're looking at very, very large scale solutions. Um, these are costly solutions, yes, and they require a lot of coordination and collaboration, but they are also solutions that address a lot of the issues we are facing as society. Um, which should make them more attractive, but obviously they are addressing things that are in the future, which makes them in many cases a lot less attractive on the sort of more narrow time scale that we're often seeing. Um, but at the end of the day, it is these things that will save us ultimately if something is going to save us. Um, it's not going to be tech. Thank you, Charlotte. And Alexa, did tech save us? Um, well, I just read that only 1% of people in low income countries have received at least one dose of the COVID vaccine. So that seems to um, answer that question for me in many ways. But I guess I would like to reiterate or sort of draw attention to what has already been said so eloquently by Charlotte and by Freya, which is that maybe in that sentence, we tend to sort of zoom in on the word tech but maybe where we should actually be zooming in is on the word us and to think about, you know, how are these risks and benefits being distributed around the world? And ultimately for something like a pandemic, this is something that we have to get out of together, all of us together. So thinking about that. Thank you, all of you. I don't know if any of you would wanna come back on the final remarks of any of the others. Um... But otherwise, I think I would say thank you all for a fascinating, uh, at times gloomy, at times hopeful, uh, but very powerful discussion. Um, uh, to the audience, thank you for uh, staying on with us. And thank you for coming. If you would like to uh, know more about our center and about future events, please sign up to our newsletter on our website at cser.ac.uk. Our next panel in this series is going to be on who is creating existential risks and why in August. So I hope uh, we'll see some of you though. And uh, thank you again for the panelists. Um, I appreciate your time and hoping for a better future.